Well, hello everybody. Welcome to the session today. I, I titled it the AS400 Security in an IBMI World Webinar. Uh, this has elicited some conversation because obviously I've mixed the AS400 and IBMI Monica in the same sentence as many people do. But uh, as you will see as we go through here, we've kind of had some discussion around different centuries and or different decades at least. And uh, hopefully by the end, you will see why I did that. My name is Robin Tatum. I am the Director of Security Technologies here at Help Systems, and I'm going to be one of your guides through our time travel journey today. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on email or follow me on Twitter. I am one of the, I think, what is it, 36 IBM champions for power um, in the world. So that is a, an honor that I, I was uh, very happy to receive this year. And uh, it's, again, also my honor to share the stage here with a, another IBM champion, which I will hand over to uh, just to give a quick intro. Trevor, why don't you say hi, let people know kind of what your, um, what your role is in the IBM I community. So thanks, Robin. Uh, I've been a champion since 2011, only because I've made a lot of noise, but uh, also been a promoter of the platform and its future. And that's, I, I believe, very, very, very important that we look at the platform as it is and that 1988 thing, as we go, take you from there, there's a huge difference and that's amazing and incredible to me. So. I'm on that end, but I'm enjoying this reminiscence today. So thanks for taking me here, Robin. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're happy to have you on board. And uh, I guess lesson learned not to uh, Google your name on, on power or on uh, the internet uh, in order to grab pictures. But we'll, we'll do our best <laughs> here. Now, th this is definitely a serious subject, uh, of course. You know, data theft and, and corruption of data is a challenge, I think, for most of us. But in the interest of Trevor and I having a little bit of fun and, and hopefully making this a, a tad less depressing, we've dubbed this as our excellent adventure. And and so my uh, my goal here is to actually teleport back and forth between two eras that have really kind of encompassed the lifespan of this server that we love so much, and and also the careers for probably many people that are that are on this call. So we're going to have Robin Trev's excellent adventure here, and we're going to start off uh, back in '88. Why don't you kick us off here, Trevor? So I just discovered on the pre-call chat that Robin actually. His first trip to America was 1988, and uh, I actually moved to America in 1988, so it's pretty important. That, what a coincidence, but uh, from what we know, this is the year that has the most Roman numerals you can pack into one date, and uh, I think the next time that'll happen is 2888, so um, I believe we're going to have uh, that year is going to be important before Y3K. Absolutely. So I think 1988 was a fantastic year, right? Um, you know, not only from the fact that that was the, the year that I touched down as a high school foreign exchange student here in the US, but it was also a, a year of ups and downs for movie star Tom Cruise. First, he had the release of the movie Cocktail, which was nominated for a Razzie Award based on how bad it was. But then he followed that with the release of Rain Man, which uh, ended up being the recipient the following year of the Academy Award for Best Picture. We also saw Tom Hanks grow up overnight in the movie Big, and we saw Bruce Willis defend a skyscraper from terrorists in the classic Die Hard, which is getting yet another sequel coming, if you're not aware. Top songs this year included Don't Worry, Be Happy, Kokomo, which actually was from that movie Cocktail, and I Think We're Alone Now by mall superstar Tiffany. This was also the birth year of Rihanna and Adele, and also Ron, little Ron Weasley from Harry Potter, a name that uh, we don't see too often anymore, but certainly grew up with many of us. Perhaps more a tad importantly, it also began the collapse of the Soviet Union. The wall began to uh, to crumble in a virtual sense before physically coming down the following uh, couple of years. Now, in computer terms, this was also a pretty important era. It was crucial in regards to the evolution of the internet. The World Wide Web began being discussed over at CERN, and the release of the first well-known internet worm happened, known as the Morris worm, after its author. So certainly from a, even a cybersecurity perspective, this was extremely relevant as well. So in 1988, we know that IBM gave us the AS400, and in 
history in retrospect, it was one of the largest releases of any platform on the planet. And the reason was is that there were two amazing computers called a System 38 and a System 36, which had come from a System 34. And businesses were just in the throes of starting to need computing and they'd taken their accounting departments from calculators and, and, and uh, you know, press and big sheets of paper and into actual business computing. And so this was a business computer and it really took off. It absolutely was the most incredible thing. And I think a lot of us remember that as being one of those most amazing things in history. And we often sort of forget how much further it's come because that need for that business computer has changed quite drastically since then. Yeah. Now let's not forget, thanks to people like Craig Rutledge, uh, this technology wonder uh, really revolutionized the, the computer gaming industry. I know there's a lot of folks out there that, that run on PlayStation and Xbox, but this is where it was at. Uh, you know, the number of hours I lost, uh, you know, sitting during various weekend activities uh, to tic-tac-toe and some other games that, that Craig had published. Uh, that I'll never get back in my life, uh, that screen time that was dedicated to this amazing gaming machine. And then, you know, the business part of this was quite incredible. And, uh, you know, there's two parts of this. We were able to store so much data in this database, amazing database that we had, but we're also able to make really nice little pop-up windows so we could pretend that we still had cards that we wrote on, but we could do all of that with amazing green screens and the amazing AS400. So obviously uh, we had a few things to connect and we had to, the most amazing thing was when you had a twin axe that you had to connect things together. And I remember this uh, amazingly, eventually twin axe got changed to token ring, which is, it's also one of those things that's amazingly solid. I recently saw a couple of years ago, uh, I got onto a brand new 747 and they had the cabinet open and it, had, it was full of token ring. So why is it available there? It's because it's solid and we were so used to this and it felt solid. All these cables felt solid for us. You know, we could, and the only problem you had was occasionally just misaligning something, but you got through that really quickly. This was an incredible age. We knew what was connected to what. We ran it through the walls. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and in the number of times I, I had to troubleshoot that cable, just unscrew it, straighten the pins and screw it back in and boom, <laughs> everything came alive. You'd hear that familiar beep and we were back online. And those those cables ran through walls and ceilings. As many instances, they were draped across the floor, but they were directly connecting those displays and the printers to that, that brick, if you will, that was wired into the port of the back of the system. And each of those bricks supported somewhere between four and eight devices. Uh, th this, in essence, was the 19... 88 version of a brick phone or a bag phone in cell phone terms and uh, definitely was was very beneficial from uh, a security perspective because that limited functionality is as literally limiting as it was was very beneficial because it meant that it was more secure we knew that any damage that was potentially possible was originating from people that were inside that environment physically inside the building uh, we did have some remote controllers and, and things uh, in the years that followed, but initially at least it, it was a very limited amount of access to the database and to the server. In fact, we hadn't really even coined the term data breach yet. I mean, there there was certainly the ability to view data that perhaps you weren't authorized to see, but it meant you had to physically write it down on a piece of paper. It's not like we could exfiltrate that data by, by throwing it down onto a spreadsheet or, or to sending it out uh, across the internet. So the security within that era was was a pretty straightforward one. We, we protected the server by utilizing command line restrictions on the profile. We, of course, had those physical limitations around the fact that if we couldn't get into the building, we couldn't even get to that display device. The protection of the data involves simply putting the user into a menuing system, which is a control that many of us are, are still leveraging today. You know, you can take option one, two, and three, and, and that's it. The privacy of that data 
was therefore handled by the application's own security. So if you weren't somebody who was authorized to write checks to, to a customer or to a vendor, then you probably weren't in that portion of the application because it said you're not intended to be there. So it made that security from server to end data pretty straightforward. And, uh, and that was a nice feeling back in the day. And then obviously we got something better than token ring. We got something better than, than the Twinax. And the next thing was is this CAT cables. And the CAT5 was a big thing for a very long time. And recently I actually saw somebody with a CAT5 converter on the end of a Twinax plug. So they could still be directly wired, but it was faster and more robust and so on and so forth. But ultimately these days, if you look as it happened, that network started actually growing beyond just the internal one. And therefore, you couldn't actually direct connect things. You had to connect to the outside world beyond just your internal network. And then once you're in the outside world, you had connections to a lot of other things. And this sort of opened you up, but it meant that the, the cabling technology was no longer that point to point. And we didn't think that way. We actually had hubs. We had routers, we had things that would enable us just to plug something in and that would be connected to everybody in, in the room. And that was amazing as well. Yeah, for sure. We also saw those limitations of those eight ports or eight addresses per port giving way to, in essence, unlimited devices now coming in from anywhere around the world at any time. In essence, if you had something with a screen on it and in some instances without a screen, we were able to make that connection in. So we've actually been able to, if you look at the world today and where we've come, things are not physically connected anymore, yet they're still connected to one another. If you look at, you know, we're talking about 5G right now, and 5G is enabling us to download a movie in seconds, literally seconds from the 30 minutes it used to take us, from the several hours it used to take us, and that's changing all the time. Uh, we have the Internet of Things where, you know, fridges are connected to one another and we can access them from our mobile phone and I can see who's at my door from anywhere in the world. The We're going to be able to get, Amazon's going to give us packages, but we're not going to have to rely on a truck. It'll just get delivered by a drone. We're actually expecting this data more and more. And it was interesting for a long time, we would have consumers with a phone would say, I can wait, but they couldn't wait for the green screen to respond. They needed sub second. Well, today, now I need sub-second response time. I need that instantaneous relief wherever I am. And I'm not really physically connected to very much anymore. Um, and especially when I have that device or that uh, machine, the fridge or uh, my stove or my doorbell all connected somehow, some way. And the wiring has started to disappear. Even recently, we added security to our house and uh, they don't even have a wire anymore. They just sell directly to them. It's amazing and incredible where we've come from relying on a, a single wire or a fiber. Absolutely, and, I, and I'm the same way. I, I'm one of those people that has a fridge that you can see inside from around the world. And, and the question you have to ask is why, right? I mean, yep. there, there's certainly some advances here that you, you have to perhaps retrofit the requirement into the fact that we can do this technology. But, you know, we're coming at full pace of, of self-driving cars and where that seemed such a fantasy 10 years ago, you know, yeah, I think we're still a little ways away from that being fully autonomous, but it, it's absolutely coming. And in the same thing with that drone delivery. Um, so we're, we're, we're either there or we're on the cusp of being there. And don't you mind that I can now look into your fridge? Absolutely. I, I leave messages for you in there all the time. <laughs> Now, one of the main features or most loved features, if you will, about IBM I is, is that it has this near 100% compatibility with those same applications that we purchased or, or we wrote decades ago. And despite all the new devices and all the new connectivity, those applications often still look pretty much the same way they always have. And compatibility is really good for productivity. We, we've all done those upgrades where, um, you know, the new system comes in and it, it's not like Windows. We don't have to rewrite stuff. We don't often even have to recompile things and it runs with the full facility of the new box. Um, it, it's good for that productivity, but when it comes to feeling like you have a brand new system, I remember how excited I was when Windows 95 came out in, 
we had long file names, right? And it took a lot of work application-wise to support the ability to have long file names, but it felt like there was an av evolution there. There was a turn of the crank that now said, I don't have to come up with some cryptic eight-character file name in order to uh, find and, and store my data. But with IBM I, we have this incredible forwards compatibility, but in many instances, we've got this technologically advanced hardware but we're not necessarily doing anything overly dramatic with the application itself. So even though we're now displaying it on the latest technology in say an iPhone or an Android phone, the application itself really hasn't been that altered since it was originally conceived. And the application isn't the platform. It's what we're used to, what we're relying upon, but it's not the platform. And sometimes that, that is a bit of confusion. Yeah, for sure. And it's the exact same way. You know, you look at this and you could call this a book, right? And, and many people do. The page still looks virtually the same. In fact, one of the selling points is they call it paper white and they make it look like an actual physical page. And in many instances, you can swipe across these devices to turn the page. So they mimic the original, you know, device, if you will, that it's designed to quote unquote replace. But in this case, it downloads its contents over the air. It permits a advanced features like sticking a, a bookmark so you can pick up where you left off and you can now store an entire library literally in the palm of your hand. I mean, these devices will sway a few ounces and you can fit an entire library of Congress on something that is, you know, fit in your pocket, fit in your purse. Now, could the look of this display change? Yeah, sure it could, but people like to have that feel of a book in their hand, right? So there's many ways that perhaps this could have evolved, but the choice currently for the user interface is to mimic the original device. It still looks like a book. It still acts like a book. And automotive technology is a lot like uh, tech, you know, computer technology. If you look at these two things, you might want to call them the same name because the manufacturer did, but they're truly very, very different machines. They still do, they get you from point A to point B, but you know that there's nothing in the right hand side one, and they actually distinguished by calling it the new Beetle, but they made that connection and people were very comfortable to bring that back. But they were very different. In the same way, in our platform, we had an AS400. That was, uh, you know, 1988. It ran for 12 years, and in 2000, they have not made another one since. They gave us something new, and in this case, they basically rebadged it, called it iSeries. But it started to change. It started to evolve and become something very different under the covers. And this is the thing. This compatibility is I actually can do the same things with the iSeries that I could with the AS400. And I was able to bring all my AS400 things applications and connectivity to the i-series but in the i-series i now had new things it wasn't a major big change the major big change really came when they gave us the next step beyond that and that was when we started to realize that there's something really different in this platform and that was the power systems it's interesting to me because we started to hear complaints around that time in the mid-range community that the box wasn't evolving, right? But what we were tending to do was load those applications up. And so it was really us gaining the benefit of that forwards compatibility, not necessarily a choice of the server in the types of applications it was hosting. And, and if we didn't take advantage of that, then we didn't actually leverage the, the ability of this platform. When we got to the power systems, again, this was a new thing, brand new power. They merged the I and the P together, system I, system P together. And then they started giving us even different things. They moved some things around. They changed the connectivity, the integration. They put together AIX, IBM I, and Linux all together. They gave us something quite incredible. And what did we do? We went and brought our older applications. So we could call this a car. It can get us from A to B. But there are so many more things it can do. It can do it faster, of course, do it more efficiently using less fuel. There are so many advantages in car technology that have happened in computer technology. And oftentimes we're still driving that beetle. So I think yeah. you mentioned that this was actually, I, I, this is actually owned by the same company that owns yeah. beetle. 
Th and this this beast is a uh, Bugatti Chiron. It's a three million dollar uh, supercar. It does over three hundred miles an hour, which is actually um, more than four times the speed of the original Beetle. And, and Bugatti is owned by the VW Corporation. So oh, technically, wow. you could call this a VW, right? But <laughs> we know it's fast. We know it's expensive. But when you look at the latest Power Nine, it has a CPW rating in excess of one point five million. So where this is a fourfold speed increase over the original first generation Beetle. We're now talking a 1.5 million increase from a CPW perspective. So to complain about power technology being outdated is really like spending that $3 million to buy a car like this and then voluntarily driving it around in a school zone and saying it's too slow, right? So it's <laughs> a lot about how we use the technology that we're given and that seems to be the pain point for many of us in the IBMI space. And it's been pretty easy for us to drive it in that school zone because it allows us to. We were allowed to do that. IBM has led us to do that. That compatibility is quite incredible. But the stuff that they've given us, why are we using? Why why do we have it if we're not using it? And to me, part of that has been the name. Obviously, the name has really been a, a major thing for us in our history. It was a 12 years of business that really needed something, and the AS400 was the answer to all of that. And so if we still think of that name, we use that name, but we've got this amazing platform, oftentimes it holds us back from leveraging all of the amazing technology that's in there and the amazing functionality in the operating system. Yeah, and in most of us, I don't know about you, Trevor, but as we get older, we don't like change a whole lot. And when people mess with something that, that we consider just status quo, we, we, tend to, uh, we tend to throw up arms about it. But in essence, this name change reflects the evolution of the technology. And if we don't have evolution, it becomes stagnant and it won't survive. So even though it meant that we all had to get used to a new vernacular and we've had to do that more than once, it is important because we're not driving that VW Beetle anymore. We have these power system servers. So we've seen what's going on back in 1988. Uh, let's dial it back to 2019. Let's come back and see what we are doing now and, and how the evolution has progressed. And most of us who have worked on the technology love the green screen. I'm one of those people, right? I, I got my start writing RPG code on an AS400 and I could move around that system so quickly and, and maybe to a lesser extent, but I still can today. So for me, based on my type of usage, the green screen is still extremely efficient, reliable, stable, all of the, the, the adjectives we can give that, but it's not for everyone. And, and I acknowledge that it's not the best interface or worst for that matter for every single purpose. And the magic of IBM I to me is that there's a choice. This next generation of applications that we're seeing bubbling up can leverage the strengths of the power server and its stability and its uh, speed and integrity, its scalability, even if you're just using it as a database server. Other applications perhaps are now leveraging the slew of open source languages that we see continually arriving on, on the, the landscape. And IBM I is, is supporting those, whether it's .NET, whether it's Ruby, whether it is uh, Python, all of these different technologies that I think people are coming out of college with knowledge of, they run on IBM I. So we're not tied or glued to this green screen option. You can certainly do it if it makes sense for you and your business, but we have options here. Now these can, in many instances, have responsive designs, which is a term we use in order to deploy the same application potentially to different devices. So whether it's being pulled up on a phone or on a laptop or some other type of larger device, we can uh, program the interface so that it is efficient and using the appropriate size. I've got more room on a 17 inch monitor than I do in the palm of my hand on my iPhone. So I can design those applications to leverage and make most efficient the use of that screen. Now, and a great example of this type of application evolution is in the Insight user experience, which is a uh, tool that's available now from Help Systems, which runs many of the Help Systems applications and, and kind of obfuscates the 
the fact that there may be different applications behind the scenes. We can go into Insight and we can pull up which application we want and it's a graphical environment in a web browser so it works in all these different devices everything from a PC down to a mobile phone, but you'd never know that there was a green screen application or any type of native code running behind the scenes, and, and nor do you need to know that. Bottom line is it's solving a business problem in a way that works for different businesses, right? If you're gonna run the original application and simply expect that you have an entirely different experience magically you can't blame that on the server and you certainly can't blame it on the operating system. It's based on our choices of where we go with application development. I think if you want to, you have to go back to 1988 with Bill and Ted. Exactly. So as we've had power systems and ABMI and we've gone from 6.1 to the 7.1.2.3.7.4, they keep giving us major functionality with major releases and also the technology releases as well. And my favorite is live partition mobility where you can take a running IBMI partition with all your applications and move it to another piece of hardware for the sake of hardware maintenance or repair. And you can do that without the users even knowing that that went on. Uh, in 7.3, we got temporal databases, which is now in my application if I turn that on and start collecting the history data, I can actually add to my SQL select statement. I always have this where customer equals 100. I can now add when, and that when clause means I can go back in time and say, give me the database when it was January the 1st, and I can actually do analysis of my data like I've never been able to do before. We've got the data, and now we can do amazing and incredible things with it. And those are just the tips are very, very large icebergs of the stuff that we get regularly, and that's every six months. We've recently had technology refresh one um, week before last for 7.4, and technology refresh seven at the same time for IBMI 7.3. Incredible value in today's power systems and IBMI. And it, and it really speaks to that constant evolution, right? From a security perspective, there's a lot of features that have been there since the first AS400 and OS400 1.0 in essence. Of course, those have also evolved as we have seen different threats appear on the landscape. And, and so IBMI has done a pretty good job of giving these increased features, whether it is row column security, whether it's encryption features, in order to help us support native database functions. Big question, of course, is whether we use them. So it's interesting that um, I had some people, connections in India, who called me and said uh, that they sold a vendor, had sold a business partner, had sold a, a Power8 system, and they wanted to use Linux on it but they sold it as an AS400. And that meant that the customer kept thinking they could keep using it the same way over and over and over, just the way it was. But when they got it, they realized that they actually needed some help in being able to manage all of the more partitions that they now wanted to use and expand. And they could do it all, but they didn't have the expertise. So selling them an AS400 meant they were short a resource to be able to handle the management of that virtualization on the power systems box. It was really great. They walked in, they said, yes, we'll sell you an AS400, and they sold them a Power8, and it caused all sorts of business problems. And it's the same with applications. You know, if you think you're working on an AS400, you might keep writing those green screen applications, and then what's gonna happen? They're gonna come in and look at it and say, well, looks old, looks outdated, and therefore, it's destined for the history bin. However, if we were doing it with all the things you mentioned earlier, with you know new open source languages and new interfaces using that solid database that we've been given and all the you know capabilities and the functionality then just by changing the way you look at this and oftentimes that's just the name IBM I Empower does so much more than your AS400 and green screen applications ever did the problem is that I can run my AS400 applications on my IBM I Empower and therefore I can remain there. And that's like you said, it's a choice. It's not the choice that I've been encouraging people to do, but it is a choice that many people still take and they're able to keep going the way they're going. That too shall pass. <laughs> they will be pressured very soon to get rid of that. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's just not a great way to get fun.
thing. I, I hear from people in my travels, and I'm sure you do, Trevor, all the time that, you know, it, it's just a name. I'm just used to calling it AS400. And it really just comes down to how do you want people to perceive this technology? And if we call it AS400, that's what people think we're on. And if we call it a VW bug instead of a Bugatti Chiron, people are going to think that that's what we're driving around in. And so it's, it's, it is a simple thing. But if it's that simple, let's work on making that perception an accurate perception. Now, for those of you that are sentimental, and Trevor, I'm sure you're sitting here just going, oh my gosh, look at that that beautiful bouncing baby boy in the photo album here. <laughs> IBM does have a small section of the Rochester family photo album for reminiscence. Now, let's face it, most of us have made a significant portion of our career and dedicated it to this technology. And it's almost like it became that comfy armchair in the corner. It's sitting by the fire, we're working on our AS400. And, and as I said before, we don't like change. The name switch was met with complete uproar by a lot of people. But those same people are the ones that think that IBM just changed the name to IBMI. And, and they're the ones that are shocked when I tell them that actually next year, the name IBMI will have had the most longevity. It seems to many that we just started calling it power. We just started calling the OS IBM I, but it will actually have been a longer lived name than AS400. So if there was an excuse to say we call it AS400 because we've had that name forever, that excuse now goes in the window, out the window. Now, those that respect this incredible legacy but embrace the idea that evolution is going to help them uh, thrive and to grow this platform then those modern enterprises are going to be able to react more quickly to the changing landscape for both business and security threats. So it, it's about respecting the AS400. It's loving the history that brought us this box, but it's recognizing that it stopped being manufactured 19 years ago and has been replaced by greater technology that appeared ever since. Now, the million dollar question for me every time I have these types of discussion is which of those security controls specifically are being used? The State of IBM I Security Study is a report that I put together with my team every spring. Uh, it's a great source of information because it documents a number of real world deployments of, uh, first of all, iSeries back in the early days and then IBM I Security over a period of the last 16 years. So these are real world server attributes and properties that we have reviewed and determined how the community is using this environment. And through the years, and I've been reading this, but uh, it was interesting that we were at uh, Common a couple of years ago and we found somebody we thought was the mythical level 10 security. And they told us that that was all okay because they were only able to access the system from one floor of one building. And the interesting part was when we actually pressed them, they said, oh no, there was another line out to another place. And most people think that just because your access is from within the building, it's therefore secure. And that's simply just not the way that security works in today's 2019 world. Well, we all know that the server in whatever name iteration we have had over the years is that the platform is marketed as being highly available, highly scalable, and highly secure, right? And we know that in many instances, we were not the ones that configured the security. There was somebody there that was the administrator before us. We also know that we run a third party application and it's up to them to secure that particular application. Um, so th there's kind of some responsibility question marks here, of course. We also know that our users wouldn't deliberately do anything wrong and that hackers who, well, we assume hackers don't come in, but if we're starting to realize that that's not necessarily the case, um, we halfway expect them to almost come in as phantom people, right? There's no hacker profile on the system, so how are they connecting in? And in many instances, they're not coming in as some undetermined uh, user. They're actually coming in as Bob from accounting or Sue from order entry. And the heart of this problem is the word secure, right? So we talk about the box being secure, 
which actually suggests that IBM pre-configured it or your application provider pre-configured it. And the reality is we're secure of both. That means that we have access to security controls, but that they require a level of intervention. And that's IBMI. And it's interesting when we look at requirements under, for example, the payment card industry, PCI, which is one of the driving forces behind security implementations, we actually see a, a warning issued about systems that have access control configured in an allow all model. And the scary, almost shocking part of that is, is IBMI is shipped to you in that state. I'm not saying it's not securable, I'm just simply saying that it takes some configuration to get you to that point. And the big question is, have we done that? Now there's, to me, three aspects to the responsibility of having a secure system. First of all, we have IBM generating and coding a um, system and an operating system that has the controls necessary to allow the rest of us to actually architect good security. We also have software vendors that are writing applications once and deploying to many uh, many customers. And, and so in this instance, we have to decide, are they leveraging the functionality that IBM provided to them? And ultimately, the buck stops with you. You own this system. You own the data that lives on this server. Are you adequately configuring the server and ensuring that you have a good OS and that the software that you use is leveraging those controls? And unfortunately, what we find is while IBM has provided a fantastic operating system, it often remains unconfigured. We're in that allow all state. We know in many instances, software vendors either don't understand the controls or simply defer the decision over to you because they know perhaps they're not the only software vendor that is providing applications to you. They may even just flatly be misconfigured, but ultimately, as I said, the buck stops with us and we tend to just bury our head in the sand because we think that the vendor needs to do their thing. We assume that IBM has pre-configured this thing well and we don't like to ask those difficult questions. So we have this responsibility triangle, but we also have a threat triangle for the exact same reasons. And if you look at uh, the role that we have in IT is we are the custodians of the data. We're the custodians of the collecting of the data. And over the last decade, the U.S. has been trying to put in place rules for personal and privacy data regulations to say what you can store, how you can store it, who has access to it. GDPR has gone even one further, one step further in Europe is actually really pushing hard to make sure that people only store the data that they really should to protect the rights of other people and other organizations. And when we do that, that data that we have left, even that data that remains that's public data along with our business data, it's even more important that we secure that because any breach is gonna cost us a lot and retrofitting always takes you much, much more time. So we have to be aware of the value of the data we're allowed to collect, the value of the data we're storing, and then what the importance of the security that we need to apply to that. And GDPR is an, an interesting one because it's really changed the landscape with regards to how we look at the cost of a data breach. So if, if you're not familiar with GDPR, uh, there's a couple of different uh, fine levels that can be levied by um, by the European Union in essence. And it the upper level is, either up to 20 million euros, which is about equivalent of 20 million US dollars, or 4% of annual gross revenue, not profit, revenue. And that could now go up into the billions of dollars. Now, when that fine is levied, it will leverage whichever is more, not whichever is less. So this is really groundbreaking, not only in the type of data that it oversees and how it's going to, uh, kind of influence what we store and how we store it, but it's also based on now 
the, the cost of that data breach. And if you think, well, that's good for the, the EU, we don't have to worry about that because we're in North America, just understand that California is in the process of passing a regulation um, that looks an awful lot like GDPR. And so we're going to see this kind of cascade or, or domino effect around the world. And so if, if you think the days of, you know, small slap on the hand are still here, understand that those days are short lived and this becomes a lot more dramatic. And even back in uh, the last decade, California's had rules that if you had one person in your database from California, you would be subject to the same fines and breach, you know, uh, penalties that it, no matter where you were in the country. Yep. So it's it's getting there and it's getting stronger. It's only going to get tighter. Yep. And that's the same with GDPR. You know, if you have information on people from the EU, then you fall under GDPR, even if you are a non-EU based company. Now, I agree that certainly not all data is created equal, right? There, there's information that we have that perhaps is collected simply because we can, but we also recognize that not all risks are created equal. So one of the steps that we strongly encourage is prioritizing the resources. Now, those could be financial resources, but they could also be human or skilled resources. This is really a necessary evil. Most of us don't have an overabundance of either financial or human resources. So we have to be selective about how we leverage or employ those things. Now a matrix like this one really can help us understand that there's a relationship that exists between the severity of impact alongside the likelihood of an occurrence. And when we take time to actually consider this, what we then do is focus on what would be deemed catastrophic and unacceptable rather than spinning our wheels, wasting precious time on what might be deemed desirable or acceptable. So not all risks are created equal in the same way that the likelihood of the occurrence is, is created equal either. So this does a really nice job of helping to prioritize and organize and make best use of those resources that we have. Now this is an a unique IBM I concept. In fact, IBM has a team called X-Force, which is actually a really cool name of itself, but they have analysts that reveal through a really interesting scatter diagram, um, the types of breaches and the size of breaches that are occurring. Here we see color indicating to us the cause of a particular breach, and the size of the circle is indicating the impact that happened. And interpreting this tells us that the vast majority of attacks are due simply to configuration or misconfiguration, right? We also see a large portion that are classified under the undisclosed or unknown category, and I would offer that invariably that's going to involve numerous other examples of misconfiguration. The key here and the takeaway from this is that a large number, if not the majority of data breaches could honestly be avoided if we just took the time to proactively do security and to do it correctly. So Robin, uh, oftentimes companies I talk to in my sessions don't really care too much about changing their security, but when I walk into companies and I have to get myself a visitor badge and I have to go through security, they say they're secure, are they still doing everything right? Well, there's certainly a lot of discussion and even a lot of investment in security in general. So where is that money and that effort going? Well, there's things that we are pretty good at. Physical security is definitely something I've seen increase over the last few years. I'm, I'm with you. I go on site to customer locations and I have to show my driver's license or they take my picture or they print a badge with my picture on it, God forbid, and I have to walk around with that on display, right? So there's things that we do physically that I think have matured even over the last five years, but just in general, I think we We've always had a sense that everything is contained within our physical building and if we can get inside then there's risk so we have to make sure that the people walking through the door have reason to be there. We then look at that from a virtual sense right it may not be a physical building constraint now but it's a firewall it's still deemed as a perimeter where everything inside is safe but anything outside is potentially trying to get in. And we use technologies like VPNs, we use segmentation of our networks, we may have uh, DMZs set up in order to segregate 
the kind of nucleus of the environment from those dangerous outer perimeter attacks, right? And we're pretty good at that. I mean, granted, Capital One recently suffered a pretty major attack. Uh, somebody got inside their firewall because they knew how to get in and attacked their uh, Amazon server environment. Now, with the exception of those types of things, we have to acknowledge that most people have a firewall. The hope is that they have configured it correctly um, and that they're using these types of communication protection mechanisms in order to, to make sure that we're only allowing trusted people inside. But the problem with that is it leaves us with what I deem a bit of a problem. The M&M &M defense is, is kind of how I refer to this, where we have this protective coding around the environment, either physically in the building or virtually through firewalls and other technologies. But that once you get inside that, it's a nice soft center, right? It's that chocolate that we all love. And this is very similar to our security infrastructure. If you're inside the firewall, or if you get through the firewall, once you get inside, how much protection do we afford each individual technology? What we should really be doing is applying our security in a layered type mentality, both at the enterprise network level, but also potentially at the server level. You know, with IBM I, we speak of exit points. We talk about library security, object level security, getting our system values right, not giving all our users all objects special authority. These controls are obviously centric to the IBM I platform and the technology, but if we don't leverage them, it means that somebody on the network has a very good likelihood of being able to connect into our server. I mentioned earlier that I do the state of IBM I security study. I saw 16 systems in this past study that had a password length of one. Now, how seriously are we taking connection security to that type of server when we see that type of transgression still occurring in 2019? So a couple of years back, I had um, a customer, an IBM I customer build a brand, it was the tech guy, he built a brand new box, power systems box, he had uh, an IBM I partition, an AIX partition, some Linux partitions, and he spent the weekend doing it, and everybody came in on Monday, signed on, and said, hey, this is the same old box because it just runs faster. So I asked him a dirty question, and I said, well, did you change the security at all when he went in there? So I don't know how many people do that, Robin. Well, for me, the issue is that in having done these upgrades in my career, I know what is deemed a successful upgrade, which is that Monday morning, the box is the exact same as the box was on Friday, but it's just running faster, right? We're not actually then re-engaging with anything from a security mindset to say, okay, the settings that we just loaded probably originated from the prior box, which if we're on a 36 month lease cycle, stemmed back three years ago, and that box got its settings from three years before that, and so on and so forth, that we quickly are doing that time warp transition back to 1988. And we know that the world is a very different place than it was in 1988. So by having the same technology or the same configuration on the new technology is really just a speed conversation. And so we have to acknowledge that that is not ideally what we're doing, right? So when, when was this 1989, this original Bill and Ted report? And, um, you know, that was around about the AS400, 1988. And it's been a long time. This has been 30 something years now. So in terms of IBM I security, what should the report or maybe our report, you know, the Robin Trevs report, how should that look in this year, 2019, right now? A most excellent question, Trev. <laughs> so the first thing we have to ask is how does IT perceive us, right? Are, are we a cost center? Are we draining resources from the organization because all we do is ask for money and, and we maintain this? Or do they perceive us as an enabler of business, which is kind of how I look at this, right? We are providing technology that allows us to respond more quickly, more effectively, more efficiently and grow the business. But that is hugely influential on how security is perceived with Within an organization as well. Now, security tends to be a bit of a wasteland, right? Um, there, there is a security initiative, hopefully, in your budget, but 
does that include IBMI? So that's a valid question that you need to ask when you are designing your plans for the current year. What is on that whiteboard? What are you working on either now or for next year? And how does that dovetail into a security conversation? We're used to assigning budget to Windows and, and Linux, but when it comes to IBMI, we still have that 1988 mindset that it's already been handled by somebody else in that triangle. And it's important that we change that mindset and include IBMI security in those costs. As I mentioned, it is a wasteland. It tends to be deemed as overwhelming, right? There's only one thing I tell people that they're more afraid of than a breach of their data. And that's breaking a perfectly workable application, right? So we tend to be very hands-off because if it ain't broke, don't don't fix it. And it can seem overwhelming because we're not just doing just what's new in 2019. We're doing 30 years worth of catch-up here, right? So there's cost justification that needs to happen in order for us to implement some of these controls. And so, as I said before, what we tend to try <coughs> to do is use that matrix to determine where is the most important allocation of resources needing to go? We need to focus on uh, the resolution of specific pains. What I mean by that is you can't just grab security by the horns and say, let's do security today. What we need to do is, like any other project, break it down into its core elements. Is there an aspect of security that deems more high risk than others? For many shops, that's based on a PC connecting into the server. It's probably not the user on the green screen. So don't spend the time, effort, and money trying to remediate the items that we don't deem as being core to where our risk profile lives, right? So focus on those specific pains, establish goals and timelines with them, and it's the old adage of how do you eat an elephant? And you do it one bite at a time. It's the same thing with IBMI security. We've got 30 years worth of catch up to do, and we approach it one step at a time. And some of those steps can be very impactful. They can be very beneficial when it comes to reducing that risk profile. We know if we don't do this, it's not just about the fact that we incur a data breach or fines from a regulatory body. We have to recognize that there are other costs associated with us not accomplishing that task. Now, not everybody has a formal regulation. If you're not publicly traded, if you don't store credit card data, if you don't have data on people that live in the EU, you may be sitting there going, I just don't have any justification for this. But what I would offer is talk to your management about the idea that a data breach or any type of technology breach can involve the loss of business process. Imagine if your invoicing system is infected with a virus. And yes, folks, that does happen on the integrated file system within IBM I. Then that process is shut down. It's no longer about whether we maintain data that might be of interest to people outside the organization, which coincidentally, they wouldn't know until they've already breached you, so you've already got the problem. But let's assume you truly don't have highly valuable data. It can still be an expensive, time-consuming recovery in order to get those processes back up and running. And don't think because you're running high availability that that is always going to be your saving grace because when something bad happens to the primary system, the function of the HA is to replicate that to any other system in an instant. And it doesn't ask the question about whether it was a desirable or undesirable activity. And executives are gonna be worried about money and money is come through their view of money is profit and how profitable that company is. And, you know, we know that there's got to be revenue part of that. Uh, there can be an expenses part of that. So if you're investing money in making more revenue by creating new product, et cetera, that's one way. But all the things you've been talking about, those cost money. And if you can invest in insurance or security or things that are not quite as tangible as a new piece of equipment, then you actually can reduce costs, reduce unexpected costs, and also keep the company in business longer, which is you've got to find that balance. And executives who understand uh, the you know business in its entirety understand that all of these things help, and they've got to find that right balance between those things. Security is always one of those things that they need to invest in because it will save them money. 
Well said. I, I couldn't agree more. It is absolutely a, a balance between reducing cost and, and increasing revenue in order to be more profitable. And the thing that we have to remember is the types of um, violations that we see happen every day that some hit the headlines, some we never hear about, can happen to any server and any operating system. The fact that we run on IBM I gives us a foundation to work from, but it doesn't come inherently pre-configured as secure. And so if we're running a line of business critical applications here, we need to give it the respect, give it the effort, and tend to it the same way we would with any other technology within the data center. And look, you can call it an AS400 all you like, and, and you will probably use it like an AS400. And IBM I is the most securable because IBM have paid attention to that and using it like it's 1988 is not going to provide the security for 2019. We live in a different world. IBM I has the capability and the functionality to do that, but you've got to use the tools to you given. You can't do it out of the box. You can't do it the way you've been doing it. It's really time that you have to understand that the data is critical, the system is critical, the applications are critical, and you've got to pay attention to them all. Well, the good news here, Trevor, and for everybody listening, is that the Good News Help Systems has an enviable number of, of really good uh, experts here that can unjumble all of these moving parts and pieces to help you mitigate items based on their risk profile. And, and certainly it can be done. We have people that do it. It doesn't always have to cost an arm and a leg or of course involve breaking those critical line of business applications that I mentioned before. So for me, one of the first steps, if not the first step, is always to understand where you are today, right? So you may be running on the latest Power 9, but if you have to admit, are you still running it as an AS400? So the first step is to get that kind of understanding, draw the line in the sand with regards to what your system currently looks like from a security standpoint. One of the best ways to do this is through a security scan. Uh, Help Systems has a piece of software that will do this in an automated state. Uh, it takes literally less than a minute to run. Um, it provides a fully tangible report that is yours to keep and to share with, with your management team. And the best part of this from your perspective is that we don't charge for it. So you can use this software at no cost. And if you would like, we will absolutely sit and go through this thing line by line with you and explain exactly what it means. We'll ask questions. You can give us information about how you feel, where your threats lie, and we can have a really good dialogue. And we don't charge for that consulting conversation either. So this is really a, a critical first step for most people to understand is the security still configured as if we were back in 1988 or have you done more since then and if so let's document it if not let's make some changes around there now, if you're interested in doing this, as I said, there's no cost. I'm actually going to uh, pop up a quick poll here while we're wrapping up. Uh, if you're interested in doing this, uh, feel free to, to give us a quick answer there, and that way we'll know to follow up with you. If you'd like more information, I certainly recognize and respect that, and uh, we can provide you with more info before you make a decision. But uh, let us know if you're interested in doing that, and we will gladly facilitate it for you. Now, while that's up, Trevor, I think, uh, let's see if there's any questions. I know we don't have a ton of time here, so if we do have a slew of questions come in, what I'd offer is we will uh, get back to people afterwards. And I know there are a few questions here that um, that have come in. So one of the things is with regards to, it looks like, um, a second, it doesn't Okay, so what are the new features in 7.4 for security? So one of the things that I'm very proud of is, is of course, the evolution. We've talked about that. But um, we try to keep up on everything that comes in new, and there are some features that have been rolled out over the last several OS releases that we can uh, kind of put under the security umbrella, whether it's stronger versions of, of uh, TLS, which is the communication security. But there's also probably one of the most influential features that was added in 7.3 and enhanced in 7.4 is called authority collection. Maybe something you've heard of, but that allows us to 
um, take a lot of the guesswork out of configuring security because the operating system now can provide us with information about who's accessing certain things, the authority they have, where they got it, and most importantly, how much authority they actually needed to perform the tasks that they were doing. So that has been a really good way of eliminating a lot of the um, guesswork that used to go into um, providing that object level security type model. And one of the things that you need to remember about that is very simple in that uh, it works when you turn it on. So you need to turn it on with 7.3, it was at uh, more of a library level. And in 7.4, it's been enhanced to fit more objects and more of a object level. So you can actually turn this on. Once you've turned it on, then you can start collecting that information. It gives you much more visibility into how the system is being used. So you can then you know, set the security correctly rather than waiting for some kind of breach. Absolutely. So from a security perspective, this is a heavy investment area for help systems, uh, both on the IBM I side as well as open systems and in other technologies. But uh, I kind of oversee the product side of it. I'm, I'm um, a colleague with Carol Woodbury, who was the IBM architect of security for many years at IBM, and, and she heads a services team. So we're, this is not just a product conversation for many organizations. It can also be simply, how do I configure the tools that I've been given by IBM. So there's a lot of work that we do here to build out a portfolio of products, but we love to pair this up with a conversation about how do we best deploy the features that IBM has been adding over the years. Now, those services can range from an initial risk assessment, which is much deeper uh, look at your system than the free scan that we do. But I always tell people, do the free scan first. I mean, it doesn't cost you anything, so it's a good justifier if you feel that you want to dig deeper. But we can also do penetration testing. We can do remediation work. In all of this process, if it seems overwhelming, we can also step in and augment your team with our own and manage your security for you. So lots of things that we can bring to the table here in that regard. All right, Trevor, I know we're uh, right at the top of the hour again, so I appreciate you joining me on this journey. It was fun. Hopefully it was informative to everybody. And uh, if you have any other questions uh, beyond the one that I was able to answer, we'll make sure that we follow up with that and get that answer back to you. But in the meantime, thanks a lot for joining on this most excellent journey, and we look forward to seeing you on an upcoming webinar in the future. Take care, everybody.